Today we're speaking with Dr. John Grootman, Chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Associate Director for Cancer Prevention and Control at the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Grootman received the 2010 AACR Prevent Cancer Foundation Award for Excellence in Cancer Prevention Research. Thanks to his work, we have a better understanding of what causes liver cancer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can you explain aflatoxins and their role in the induction of hepatocellular carcinoma? Well, the aflatoxins are a fascinating group of compounds. These are compounds produced by various molds that contaminate the food supply all over the world. These molds, the spores from these molds, are found in soil all over our planet and in many cultures, particularly very economically poor cultures, where staple foods such as corn, wheat, rice, and peanuts are a major source of the energy that people consume, aflatoxin can contaminate and grow and develop both in the field, after harvest, and during storage. These compounds were originally discovered because of a, an enormous toxic event in the UK in 1960 where a contaminated peanut meal shipment was fed to hundreds of thousands of turkeys. These turkeys died very rapidly and a number of toxicologists characterizing this outcome recognized that this moldy contaminated peanut meal was the source of the toxic principle. That then led to an analysis and, and discovery of what was the nature of this particular toxic material and that led to the discovery of aflatoxin named because the mold turned out to be Aspergillus flavus, hence the A. flavus toxin. In studies that were conducted at MIT in the early 1960s into the late 1960s, it was then found that aflatoxin was the most potent liver carcinogen ever tested in experimental models. So not only did we have a compound that caused tremendous toxicity, we also had a compound that was an extremely potent liver carcinogen. Further studies in Asia and Africa during the late 1960s and early 1970s resulted in the discovery that aflatoxin was a very common contaminant of the food supply of many poor people around the world. And indeed, the levels of aflatoxin tracked with high rates of liver cancer in these regions. One of the striking features of liver cancer in these regions of the world is that the average age of onset of liver cancer was between age 45 and 50. And what was completely devastating for people who were diagnosed with liver cancer is that the average time from diagnosis to death was on the order of six to eight weeks. And unfortunately, this really hasn't changed over the ensuing decades, but these early investigations provided some of the initial linkage between aflatoxin exposure, contamination, and the resultant uh, formation of hepatocellular carcinoma in many people in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. What is the relationship between exposure to aflatoxins and infection with hepatitis B? Well, here we have the, uh, the coalescence of a series of fields, both in the viral epidemiology area along with the chemical carcinogenesis field. And what really drove a lot of this work was the development of biomarkers, in particular biomarkers of the hepatitis B virus and early studies demonstrating that the hepatitis B surface antigen could be a measurable biomarker in people that corresponded to exposure to the hepatitis B virus. And when one looked at the global map, it became immediately obvious that areas of high prevalence of the hepatitis B surface antigen corresponded with those same high regions of hepatocellular carcinoma. So by the mid-1970s, uh, there was a strong hypothesis that exposure to this virus was related to the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. This then led to a, a profound and important epidemiological study in Taiwan where over 22,000 men were followed for seven to eight years and the simple question was asked of, of those individuals who carried this hepatitis B surface antigen, did they go on or have higher risk for the development of hepatocellular carcinoma, and it turned out that those individuals who were surface antigen positive had a greater than 100-fold increased risk for the development of this devastating disease. Those investigations really provided the first very important evidence that the hepatitis B virus played a major role in the development of this disease. But at the same time, it was also recognized that many different countries around the world 
had high prevalence of the of the uh, hepatitis B surface antigen in their population, but liver cancer rates varied widely from country to country. And that in turn led to the thought that aflatoxin exposure, again this very potent liver carcinogen in experimental models, could play an important role in the development of this disease. And that in turn led to the multi-investigator, multi-institutional study that I was privileged to be involved with that really identified that there was this greater than multiplicative interaction between the hepatitis B virus and aflatoxin exposure with the development of hepatocellular carcinoma in eastern China. Would you describe how this work provides new prospects for prevention in high-risk populations? I think it's very important to recognize that since the early 1980s, we have an absolutely wonderful vaccine against the hepatitis B virus. And this vaccine has been incredibly important in lowering the prevalence of HPV infection in economically developed countries around the world. The pattern of exposure and infection to the hepatitis B virus is very different in Asia and Africa. And in these countries, children become infected before age two, often before age one, because the transmission of the virus from mother to child or child to child is very different than what you find in North America or in Europe. And as a consequence, the vaccine needs to be given to newborns. And the simple reality is, is that this vaccine, if given to newborns, will result in at least another 100 years of vaccination strategies in order to eliminate HPV from our planet. And it's simply a matter that we have to vaccinate at the birth rate of the countries. At the same time, aflatoxin exposure also starts in utero because when the mom uh, eats contaminated foods, these foods uh, can cross the placenta. The fetus, uh, the liver in the fetus, has the potential of bioactivating aflatoxin to cause damage. And a number of investigations have demonstrated that starting in utero and continuing all the way in early life and through your life to, uh, lifespan, aflatoxin exposure is also occurring. What are the next steps for your research? I think we have a, a profound interest in one, uh, proselytizing for the implementation of vaccine strategies against the hepatitis B virus. At the same time, the compelling need to develop new therapeutic intervention strategies against HBV, given that we have over 400 million people on our planet that are at extreme risk for the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So this really compels the research community and the pharmaceutical industry and policymakers around the world to develop strategies that can affect those individuals who will not benefit from the hepatitis B vaccine simply because they're already infected. At the same time, when you look at our, our epidemiological data and realize that there, there is this powerful synergistic interaction between HBV and aflatoxin, from those data you can readily discern that if we are able to lower aflatoxin exposure in these high-risk populations, that that in turn will also result in a lowering of the impact of hepatocellular carcinoma. We think that this can be done in a number of ways. One is through primary prevention where governments and departments of agriculture and ministries of agriculture can provide better seed for farmers in order to grow plants that are less susceptible to mold contamination. And then our work uh, that is really leading, can we use uh, chemoprotection strategies in very high-risk populations as a way of increasing the detoxification and protection mechanisms in people in such a way that if they are exposed to aflatoxin in the diet, their body's defense mechanisms have been enhanced such that the DNA damage and the resultant deleterious impacts of aflatoxin would be mitigated. Dr. Grutman, thank you so much. Thank you.